Okay, looks like we're on, Chris. All right. Let me secure the recording device. Imagine doing shows on phones <laughs> mm-hmm. in the 90s. In the 90s when we started, no <laughs> such thing. I know. And now the networks are doing it like this. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, they have to. It's such a, <laughs> such a bizarre change. Yeah, it's a really weird time in so many ways. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I'll introduce the show. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's uh, another episode of Sajiwa's low-key, uh, single-take, no-edits, uh, Skype <laughs> video interview show. This is, is that the episode... official title? Sujiwa? That's the official title. <laughs> okay. yeah, I, have, I have a graphic for it. I'll post it up <laughs> well, with, uh, when I post it up on my blog. This is the episode nine, and we're going to do ten episodes for season one. Next, this, this time we have uh, Chris Hansen experienced filmmaker and film professor from Waco, Texas. And he's made a lot of interesting movies. We will talk about all of them and his new one and festival problems due to COVID-19. Yeah. And uh, next episode will be Melanie Addington uh, from the Oxford Film Festival. Do you know about that festival, Chris? I'm familiar with it. Yeah, they're a great festival. Yeah, yeah. Melanie is very active on the web. So we became friends. So... Mm-hmm. <clears throat> she'll be Great. she'll be on the next episode that'll be episode 10 uh and then we're done for season one then hopefully i can make some movies this summer and fall yeah yeah hopefully we all can yeah there we go hold on let me there we go make sure i'm not too sweaty there <laughs> we go i just took a walk so kind of kind of a summery weather <clears throat> all right i think yeah. we're set <clears throat> i think we're set so uh, what's the name of your latest film? It is called um, Seven Short Films About Our Marriage. Very fancy title with our yes. in parentheses. Oh, like yeah, it. the our in, is in parentheses because uh, yeah. I was playing around with the idea of, um, I mean, I, I really, when I was writing the film, it felt like a film that I would title Scenes from a Marriage. Mm-hmm. Like Burnham. If that title had... <laughs> if yeah, the title hadn't already right. been taken much more famously by Bergman. So I was trying mm-hmm. to think of an analog for a title like that. And um, and then I, because the character in it is a filmmaker, I thought uh, that this would be seven instead of se- scenes from a marriage. It's actually seven short films about marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I put the hour in there because I wanted to create the, the kind of the idea that he he, <clears throat> he was at least in part the storyteller behind mm-hmm. these stories so mm-hmm. that makes sense that, yeah it's a good yeah. title yeah after this conversation i'm going to watch the movie then i'll blog about it uh, okay great yeah this is this is my warm-up to the movie <clears throat> okay watching yeah, i didn't want to rush through it today i had uh last night i got an idea to make a movie called actually i i had the idea for a while but uh, i finalized it yesterday uh a movie called uh low-key wizard <laughs> it's uh he's a wizard but not that grand you know, kind of low key, <laughs> kind of in the same genre as Werewolf Ninja Philosopher, right? Playing around with these, uh, yeah, these uh, fantastical, mystical figures. So yeah, yeah. But Werewolf <laughs> has like unlimited powers. He's almost like a superhero. We want to. <laughs> I want to bring him back with the proper makeup. Uh, Art and I are talking about it maybe for next year. But oh, great. The low key wizard is uh, like you know. More power than an ordinary human, but not a grand wizard. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> in New York, solving problems. Uh, so uh, Lester Green, uh, a friend of a friend who's an actor, he's going to play the lead, and hopefully we can shoot it in the fall. So let's see. Great. So I was up uh, planning that out. Anyway, let me congratulate you on your background. It's a nice uh, depth of, you know, shallow depth of field look. It is completely skype enabled thing i i'm i'm not responsible for the technology but i i like it because i i've been working out of my home for you know months as we all have and um, mm-hmm. i don't have a home office so i'm um, i've basically been situated in the dining room mm-hmm. and uh, people looking at the china cabinet behind me and looking at the knickknacks in there that and i started to use the blurry background because i think it just keeps all that out of the yeah. shop. So. It's it's better. I see why filmmakers like the uh, shallow depth of field. Yeah, I'm a fan. Yeah. <laughs> you probably yeah, yeah, noticed yeah. a lot in the well. You haven't watched the film yet, but you'll see a lot of that in the film. So yeah, I saw the trailer. It, it looked like it was shot well, and the color grading was done well. Yeah, yeah. Our, our uh, cinematographer is also our colorist. Uh, he mm-hmm. he uh, 
you know, when you're working in the indie world like this, that's not that uncommon, mm-hmm. um, especially in the ultra low budget world that we're in. Um, and he, uh, you know, he's a, he frequently colors his own work and um, he wanted to, you know, he was going to be involved in the coloring, even if he wasn't the colorist. So we, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and he, but he has those skills anyway. So we opted just to have him do it. Yeah. It, lo- it looks really good. A good skin tones, everything. Uh uh melds together nicely um yeah about working in the indie low in the no budget indie film world that has changed a lot in the last 30 mm-hmm. years you got into filmmaking in the 90s did you can you hear sorry me? you froze a oh, little yeah, i bit think there. we froze okay now we're back on okay we're good okay good yeah sorry yeah that's okay you got into filmmaking in the 90s yeah, so I actually went to film school in the 90s, um, <clears throat> so I was learning on film, um, mm-hmm. and uh, so it was just just pre-digital revolution, really. Mm-hmm. Um, probably the last generation of film school student to learn um, f- film editing on film, um, yeah, because I did, right I did about the, the time thing. I, yeah, right about the time I graduated, they got, I think, their first, um, it wasn't Avid, but whatever, um, whatever was the analog, there was another version of <clears throat> Adobe Premiere. Uh, was it Premiere? No, it was pre okay. Adobe Premiere. Media oh, there was a, there was a high end like thing. That. Yeah, it was a very high end system, and I but I never learned it because I had graduated already. So, um, but I hung around working at the university for a while, and then digital started to come in with the Canon XL1, which I'm sure mm-hmm. you remember. Yep, we had I one, shot on the, it. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we had one in the department where I worked, and um, so I was able to use that to make a short film and learned um, Final Cut Pro at that mm-hmm. point because yeah. I, I had never been a Mac user up until that point, but a mm-hmm. uh, you know our college intern <laughs> taught me how to use Final Cut Pro, and so I started learning digital editing finally, you know, after I'd been out of school for a while. Yeah. So uh, you were saying about low budget filmmaking. Now, low-budget filmmaking is almost amazing, like uh, the things yeah. you could do. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, um, you know... It's not, e- it's not even the thing. It's just uh, yeah. filmmaking with no large salaries. Yeah, and so ultimately, if you look at a film like mine or the films like what you make, um, I think that you can make a film look really great. I think where the budget shows is in locations and mm-hmm. size of the cast and, and mm-hmm. of course stars <clears throat> we don't have any celebrities and that shows but it's also just the size and scope of the story you can tell mm-hmm. uh, unless you know how to do i mean i've seen some no budget films that had great special effects because the filmmaker him or herself knew how to do that and right. so they could you know create a whole world uh of cinema that i couldn't do because i don't know how to do those things mm-hmm. <clears throat> but i think um yeah, if your story is naturally just a few people and it's real world based, uh, you know, like uh, like some Woody Allen movies, but Woody Allen used to have like a whole string of actors yeah. in his movies. But I think like ma- like Richard Linklater, the yeah, before yeah. sunrise kind of thing. I think yeah. that's kind of inspiration of of this particular film. I think. Yeah, yeah. The same thing with the, what I'm working on now. The big thing, which is uh, called uh, the Secret Society for Slow Romance. So, right. Had, uh, well, the title. I was very intrigued by the title. So, yeah, it started off as slow romance, which is just going to be two people, very real, like your movie, uh, like like very super real, like your movie uh, where we started. Two people mm-hmm. talking, bunch of dates. That's it. Then I got the idea to uh, put a save the world a subplot into it with the secret society. So I was like, all right, well, this is more fun. So now it's that. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, it gives you a little, it's a little easier to sell right. that, not to get people the, interested. Get, to people get people interested. interested. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because um, I think where we started is a good example. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a, a slow moving, intentionally slow moving. I don't use that as a negative. Right. Um, right. Slow moving, talky story about one night where these two people meet and consider whether they're going to have an affair. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I really still. Uh, like uh, quick, movie. quick question. Did you see My Night at Mods? My Night at Mods, I know that yeah, title, but I don't think I've ever uh, seen it. A uh, famous French filmmaker. Uh, yes, Nick. yes. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I'm familiar with the film, but I haven't actually seen it. So yeah, it's, yeah, there's, yeah. I have a couple of blind spots like that where I'm like, yeah, some there are some foreign films that are still in my blind spot. So Yeah, I have I have a ton like that. But uh, 
that movie <laughs> made him made him famous. Uh, and it was about two people, Snowden, mm-hmm. wondering whether they should have sex. Catholic background, so there's a lot yeah. of Catholic issues. And yeah, uh, yeah so you, yeah, that's there you go. That's something we could easily make. You know, right? I mean, and that's yeah. The, the film was written. That film in particular, where we started, was written with those limitations in mind. You know, mm-hmm. two people, one night, um, limited locations because they're bo- they both have checked into a motel mm-hmm. on the same night, uh, it separately when they meet, and um, and so we're kind of in and around the motel. Mm-hmm. And of course, when you write something like that, you think, well, yeah, we'll do the motel, and then we'll go to a diner, and then you know, go to a liquor store. And even those things just starts to snowball. Those things become right. harder and harder to find. <laughs> right. It's like a, the motel was hard enough, but then getting a, a diner <clears throat> that we can shoot in at night at a liquor store. A liquor store was surprisingly hard to get um, because mm-hmm. of all the rules surrounding no doubt. You know, what times they can be open and who can be in them and everything. So, And you, ha- and you have a pretty large crew usually because you use the students from uh, the film program yeah. to get some real life experience. Yeah, we give our students real uh, onset experience that they've never had before. You know, it's one thing to shoot. Like we can teach students how to make films in classes and and how to even outside of class, how to work on projects. But it's a completely different animal when you've got, you know, several professional actors and, a, a, a you know, a um, schedule of 10 hours to 12 hours a day mm-hmm. and really and, and some overnights and really knowing how that's going to work. So great experience for them but a lot of you know they lack experience complications in. and a lot yeah so they're often complications not caused by them just uh, difficulties that come yeah, with the yeah. territory yeah it just becomes like a regular shoot and you know yeah, yeah. like oh two people i could do it no <laughs> it mm-hmm. becomes like two weeks it's yes. a two week long shoot so you uh, why did you decide to get into film you know i grew up wanting to tell stories i was mm-hmm bound and determined to be a writer. Um, all of my idols were writers. Uh, and when I say writer, I think of um, novels, fiction, literature. Um, and then, uh, you know, so I wrote short stories and stuff as when I was younger. And when I went to college, I majored in English. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, still thinking fiction and literature. And um, by the end of college, though, I had, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I, I mean, honestly, just tell you more directly how it worked, but I discovered um, film school as an option. Uh, mm-hmm. It just wasn't something on my radar, you know, in the early 90s. Right. And then I read a magazine article back when we read hard copy magazines. Yeah, yeah. This, <laughs> um, was, this was like in the late 90s? That you're no, it was early, early, early 90s. 90s. Like 95? Yeah. No, like 90, 91. 90s, got it, got yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, very early 90s, I read um, uh, an article called... Um, SRO, standing room only, SRO mm-hmm. at FSU, or meaning film school U, mm-hmm. SRO at film school U. And it was just, it was an article in a film magazine, I don't know if it was Premier Magazine or something else, but um, about basically the explosion of film schools and the explosion of attendance at film schools. And it was right. like, like, literally like that light bulb moment mm-hmm. where you're like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I want to make nice. movies. Right. Uh, I never really had taken off as a fiction writer in college it just i wrote stuff but it just wasn't a form I, like i couldn't kind of i still want to write fiction but it just mm-hmm. is a thing that my brain doesn't naturally go towards but i had really become enamored of film and art film in college especially and uh, uh i just so it just all of a sudden that's what i wanted to spend the rest of my life doing so nice uh, so in college i you know towards the end of college i started trying to pursue that as much as i could i was at a, a college that didn't have any film program Mm -hmm. so uh, then I went to grad school for film and studied it there and um, and yeah ever since been working towards it but it wasn't really till I you know I kept writing and trying to make things but this was again most of it pre-digital couldn't really make anything until the Canon uh, XL1 came out which even then that didn't that that was early to early 2000s right uh sounds right yeah yeah Um, yeah, yeah. yeah I think so so I you know, I made a short film on that, which, you know, I tried to then, I don't know how well you remember these things, but back then when, you know, you choose something on video, now we can, it looks like film right out of the right. box with, with some of these cameras. But uh, back then with an XL1, it looked like video. 
and yeah, sure. you could try to apply uh, filters in mm -hmm. post to get a film look, but it was a really a rough process. It wasn't like, okay, just apply this filter. It was like mess with the three, two pull down and yeah. you really understand it. And so I was muddling in the dark and I, you know, I eventually got, did you use the DVX 100 ever back in the day? Yes. Yes, yeah. I did. That I had a 24 P look that made it easier. Yeah. When that came out, I I actually bought one uh, because Good. I figured I'd do freelance work on it as well. I did a little bit of right. freelance work then, so I had that DV. I still have that DVX one. Nice, somewhere. that's a good camera. <laughs> I love the form. I love the form factor of that. So to this day, I just bought a new camera, a Sony MC88, and it reminds me of the DVX one hundred, and yeah. uh, everything's all in one. Forget the DSLRs with all the other stuff. Okay, you froze a little. Yep. Are we back on? Okay, good. You too. Okay, we're back now. <laughs> yeah, the show show's gonna go on regardless. That's fine. Yeah, <laughs> mine says for connection right now. So my but now okay, that went away. So yeah, we're good. Good. That's good. <clears throat> so yeah, I was saying the I I fell in love with that form factor of a camcorder yep. where everything you need is there. Forget the DSLRs yep. with like fifty thousand things attached to it. So I'm still yeah, shooting I, on camcorders because of that. Yeah, I. I so I have the luxury now because I hire a DP and, mm -hmm. and usually I think with all of my films, the DP has also been the camera op. I mean, he, mm -hmm. my DP is op themselves because that's just the way they've always, you know, in the yeah. uh, really low budget in the world, that's not that uncommon. Right. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, but I'm fortunate that as, as I've been able to make films at Baylor, I've pushed away from the technology side of having to understand everything about the cameras. That used to be obviously something I had to do, but it wasn't something mm -hmm. that ever naturally to me. Got it. I, I moved yeah, away. I'm, from into, I'm into the tech stuff now. It gives more control. Totally agree with you. If you understand it, it's you have the control. And if you're going to be doing it the way you're doing it, where you're really, I'm assuming you're operating or you're doing yeah, most I'm of I'm shooting. I'm shooting everything. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So you have to know that stuff. Yeah. yeah. If I want the film to look as good as I as like I think the new film looks, I'm mm -hmm. not going to make it look that good. Right, right, right. So I'm going to get somebody who knows how to make it look that good, right. and you know we can. And I really with with this film especially, um, you know, expanded kind of my attitude of how to work with a, a DP and let the DP. Um, sorry, I, I turned off my texts, but it's still uh, ringing. I hope that's not messing up your. Oh, no, I'm not seeing it on this end. No, so, just the noise. I didn't know if you were oh, okay. hearing it. No, no, I'm not hearing it. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so working with a DP and, uh, and not trying to be, you know, if, it's, if you're a one-man band, everything's your vision. If, right. you are, um, if you're the director, it's your vision, but it's the, when you're working with a DP who's also a talented creative, it's inviting that person into the process and saying, right. here's the story I'm telling how are we how can we work together to bring that and and that's what i really felt like happened on this this project is so there's that's a, ideal yeah there's an aesthetic that i was going for which uh, when you see the film there's a lot of um close 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 shots of faces mm -hmm. uh, uh that and lingering shots on a single person who is the focus of the scene where we'll stay on a person's face for you know three four minutes without cutting Mm -hmm. that was kind of one of the aesthetics I was bringing into it. And so within that, you know, he and I had a lot of creative discussions that informed what we were going to try and do. Awesome. How did you get into teaching film? Um, well, I, so got out of film school, wanted to make films, really didn't have any intention to move to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And this you was know, in, this was when 2000s finished, finished school. My first degree in 95, first mm -hmm. graduate degree in 95. And, uh, so I went to work for the university and eventually by, you know, over about five years, I started doing some production work at the university. This is at Baylor? Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. I went to grad school, Regent. Got it. Um, and there, so, it's, you know, I wasn't, I was writing scripts, trying to sell them, very naive about how the process worked when you mm -hmm. don't live in Hollywood, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I mean, I got some interest, which was enough to keep me working, keep me writing. I was pretty prolific at script writing back then. <laughs> now, now it takes me a lot longer to write script, but then I was right. out. Um, so, but I got, I got frustrated um, at the just endless kind of rejection that comes with the, the yeah. game, especially because I wasn't writing 
and I never have really written, as you've seen with my films, the kind of stuff that sells to mm-hmm. Hollywood. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I mean, especially it's, back uh, then, especially in the yeah. early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, you know, there are people who are making those kinds of films and much better than mine, I'm sure. But from my perspective, you know, an outsider like me who, who you know, is not in the game, you know, is not going to write a film like that and then send it off and get an agent and sell it. So, yeah, even Richard Linklater had a very hard time getting, uh, right. I think, uh, some many of his movies made, even after proving, you know, yeah. vast oh, yeah. success over and over. And he, and starting out, he was doing slacker, you know, right. on a no on a no budget, you know, right. no black star. And white. Mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, and even that film made in in such a way that you, you know you could shoot one <laughs> right. one episode or piece of it, and then the other pieces don't have to connect. So, right. or continuity. So anyway, um, about two thousand, uh, I decided to go back and get a. a another advanced degree, the MFA, so that I could teach. I just mm-hmm. kind of came to the conclusion that if I wasn't going to be able to make films the way, I mean, it was really kind of this period of soul searching. And I, I was feeling like I'm not going to be able to make films. It's all I really want to do, but I, but I love film. So rather than working this job where I'm using my skills to make basic productions that mm-hmm. aren't creative to me at all, um, it felt very dead end to me at that point. So I went back and got the MFA uh, with the intention of teaching. And then a few years after I got the MFA, I got the job at Baylor. And then the ironic part, I tell my students that the ironic part about getting the job at Baylor is that as most people, most people understand the concept of tenure at a university, which means, you know, if you're going to get tenure, um, tenure is, after a probationary period, usually six years or so, um, then a faculty member who's on the tenure track has to get tenure or they lose their job. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I was hired onto the tenure track and my, instead of writing articles or research or books, I w- had to make films. And okay, got it. Those, that, yeah. was their, that was their requirement? For me, yeah. Right, for, right. For, for, and so like my colleagues in theater have to, if they're acting professors, they have to act in professional performances. And, Got it. and so for me, it was making films and those films having what we call in academia peer review. Got it. Peer review is a film festival or distribution or those kinds of things. That's so, ideal for you. Yeah, well, yeah, ideal all setup. it wasn't a, uh, uh, like a thing I wanted to do. It was the thing I had to do to right. keep my job. Right. So... Um, Fortunately, I was at, my department was very supportive. Obviously, they wanted me to get tenure. And so they gave me some resources to make a film. And, and we created this you know, concept of having the students work on the films. And, uh, and you know, the rest is history. I've been making films at Baylor ever since. And it's an incredibly satisfying experience. Awesome. And you've made uh, like six features now? Uh, this was my fifth. This latest okay, is my good. fifth feature. Yeah. And uh, when you made the first one, that was the, that was the Messiah one, right? Yes, the proper care and feeding of an American Messiah is the there title. Go. Good title. Obviously, yeah. you can tell I like long titles. That's right. Yeah, we showed that in Maryland, right? You came mm-hmm. to Maryland to show that. Yeah, the Micro Cinema Film Festival, right? That's right. That's right. Two thousand five. Uh, let's see. I think we shot it in two thousand five, so that would have been probably two thousand six. I think. So. Wow. Yeah. Fourteen years ago. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. a long time. <laughs> That's why you have gray in your beard. <laughs> that's right. That's like where this. That's why this is the old men talking about film. Back in the day, we didn't have cell phones. Yeah, right. <laughs> with beards, shot in during COVID nineteen. <laughs> yeah, uh, the two thousands have gone by super fast. I yeah. can't believe it's twenty twenty. Can you? No, no. That the so many memes about twenty twenty these days because of all the craziness. But right. one of one of the ones that resonates is that, you know, we thought 2020 was going to be, you know, the future. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like because of COVID and everything else feels like we're living in the past. But definitely. Uh, but uh, filmmaking wise, it is the future. I mean, it's amazing that yeah. I could or Steven Soderbergh can shoot a feature on an iPhone. I saw some of the production stills. It's just the dude on a tripod and the iPhone. <laughs> Well, he knows, uh, you know, the iPhone, I, I tell the students sometimes, you know, shoot with what you have. Right. Uh, that's what we did when we were younger. Um, mm-hmm. And the iPhone is actually 
if you know how to control its, uh, you know, video features, which they are controllable, but it's tricky. Mm -hmm. But if you know how to control it and you connect a good mic or, or you don't even connect, just record sound separately, mm -hmm. you can make something really good with that. Yeah. I mean, it's better camera uh, quality than we had when we were shooting yeah. with, you know, even the DVX 100, which looked right. great, but from a resolution standpoint, it was pretty low. Yeah, so. standard definition. Yeah, not yeah. not even yeah, HD. Yeah. Forget no. 4K. iPhone can shoot 4K. Mm. And also, you got uh, camcorders like the one I got. It's like twelve hundred, thirteen hundred dollars now. Really, like everything you need to gather um, really pro level video and audio. I don't know if you saw the um, I like on the fifteenth of uh, May. I did a video of the neighborhood. So it's on. It's no, on Vimeo. Just... Yeah, okay. I'll send you the link. It's amazing, uh, amazing what it could do and uh, and the look it can create. Um, yeah, so I think film wise, this is an amazing time period. Um, you can, I agree. Uh, yeah, like YouTube is getting like three hundred thousand uploads. No, three hundred hours of material being added every hour. So <laughs> people, so YouTube has sort of eclipsed. Uh, Hollywood in terms of how much content is produced every year. They do like billions of hours every year. Amazing, yeah. right? We and didn't have anything monitor. like that in the 90s. No, no. <laughs> the problem is, I mean, I think, um, you know, what you, you were joking earlier in text that uh, you were looking for my trailer on um, right, YouTube. YouTube. <laughs> right. YouTube. So it's on Vimeo. So I don't go to YouTube for like... Uh, I don't post stuff on YouTube. Um, you, should, and, you, should, you should do it. I found out oh, totally. accidentally yeah. that I had 17,000 views on YouTube. <laughs> That's great. No, you're right. <laughs> you're right. I should post it. I, because why not? It's just another place that people discover stuff. They um, promote not, it really well. They promote stuff really well. Yeah, it's really not like an intentional thing. I just always think, like, I have a right. pro Vimeo account, and so I, you know, I post Me too. and the limp. So I just post stuff on Vimeo, and the quality's so much better. Much better. Um, so, um, but yeah, the stuff, there's so much stuff going up on YouTube that is, uh, I mean, this is, <laughs> I, I'm sounding like the, you know, old man yelling at the cloud, but. Yeah, yeah, uh, we are. We are the old man. You know, it's just like I don't care about most of what's going up on YouTube because it's it's vlogs and and um, product opening. <laughs> right. I did I did one of those and I got like 200 views on it already <laughs> from, my, from my camera. Unboxing videos. Yeah. Yes, I did one of those for the new camera. My I have a video with 40 maybe 4,800 views, mm -hmm. and it was a one minute uh, camera test on a two minute camera test for a cinema look using the Canon XA11 from like three years ago. I posted it up, forgot about it. And I was yeah. like, wow, 4,000 views. Uh, the yeah. reason I brought up uh, YouTube is for the current generation of people getting into film. Um, yeah. There are people making like serious money on YouTube, doing vlogs, doing uh, podcast shows, doing uh, ASMR videos. Yeah. It's definitely an amazing, amazing resource just to build a community around your brand, your content. And some people are making millions of dollars, some thousands, some hundreds. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It I'm is. Sure you're, I'm sure your kids are into it, uh, the, the students at, uh, in your school. Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that um, they're, they know what's out there. Uh, but what's interesting to me is watching the evolution of these things. So obviously people are still using YouTube and, right. and monetizing it, but... Um, but people are using Instagram uh, mm -hmm. a lot and Instagram mm -hmm. stories and, and Instagram, what is it called? IGTV or whatever, Instagram television on the app. Mm -hmm. um, I see that a lot. And then of course, TikTok is taking over uh, right. with that kind of short form thing that, you know, that's what my, my, not my students, but my kids are doing a lot of my younger nice. kids doing TikTok nice. all the time. And so, yeah, there's all these different forms of storytelling. And now, because of, I mean, because we don't know how long this uh, virus, you know, stuff is going to last, right. we're starting to have to think about, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to tell stories? Um, it's going, obviously, the kinds of stories we're going to tell is going to change because the way we can tell stories, at least for now, is different. Limited, yeah. Yeah, it's very limited. 
Um, so yeah, I'm kind of exploring that for my next project right now with some colleagues. I reimagine slow romance as primarily a Zoom or Skype based thing. And yeah. I was like, nope. I was like, nope. I'm not gonna do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the you know I, one of the things I'm interested in kind of figuring out is um, how how do, if we're communicating solely over these methods, mm -hmm. uh, how does that? I mean, frankly, how does that change the way we communicate with each other? Right. You know, if if um, you know, are people are people meeting and dating and falling in love? Uh, over Zoom, <laughs> uh, I, I would it's, guess that it's, it's happening. It's going to happen. But even yeah. prior to the even prior to the uh, pandemic, long distance relationships happened over video and yeah, over totally. text. Over like people in different cities meet online. Then yeah. you know they don't really actually meet for months down the road. So and back in the day, letters, right? You yeah. know, it's totally. The, oh, yeah. the tech the tech is so good it's totally possible it's an extension of of yeah of writing letters um right. yeah I, and you know i've known you for well, 15 years now and that's right uh, we've met in person once right we it's just hung out one once time. Yeah, yeah we had some chinese food before that <laughs> show <laughs> yes <laughs> so yeah i mean i you think about that it's kind of crazy and so yeah why can't people meet and have a relationship entirely online especially I mean, we, the things that we thought we couldn't do before, mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean just about relationships, but I mean even just work. Like, right. no, we can't work from home. No, we can't. All, we can't have all online classes. All of a sudden, with a week's notice, <laughs> we, we were all to. doing it. <laughs> That's yeah. right. <laughs> so, also, yeah. also, relationships may be better if you never meet in person. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Date someone, marry them. Keep it all, you know, yeah. over, over Skype. Never meet a yeah. person. <laughs> well, and you know, the interesting thing is, if your if your relationship starts that way, then there is a tension for when 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 we actually meet. Is this going to work? Um, how much uh, are we? Um, you know, we we talk about how we pre only present our best selves on social media, mm -hmm. um, but don't we? I blurred my background. You have your movie poster over your right. head. You know, we're presenting ourselves a certain way. And right. so if you're dating somebody online or you're working online um, and, and having meetings, then you're presenting an image of yourself. And so mm -hmm. that's the thing I'm very interested in exploring is the images we present of ourselves through these means. Um, it's no different from when you're writing letters and you're you know, you're conveying it. If when I was writing letters to my then girlfriend, now wife in college before we had email, mm -hmm. yes, I sound really old saying that. Back, I know, in, the but, Back yeah, in the day. But, you know, um, you're presenting kind of a, an image of yourself as the person in love with this person. And you know what I mean? It's, it's always an image that you want to present of yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, although I, I told I'm told I'm an Enneagram three and that's very important. The threes presenting a certain image. So maybe that I don't know much about Enneagram, but that's what I'm told. So okay, good. I, I don't know what that is, but I'll look into it. But <laughs> okay. even but even in uh, real life dating pre pre pandemic, uh, on the during the early period, and I totally. just had to think about this because I'm writing this uh, slow slow romance comedy. During the early periods, you censor what you show. Totally. Uh, yeah, and then when you live together, really, you have to live with someone for a period of time to figure out who they really are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think this is why, and, you know, I've now I've written about for my last film, this one that you'll watch is about marriage, and it's, you know, part of what the movie is about is um, you go into marriage, as I did, naively thinking um i'm in love with this person love conquers mm -hmm. all kind even if you don't actually think you don't say that but you think right. well, we're in love and then you get married and you're like fighting over you know she leaves the clothes on the floor and you know he doesn't isn't as responsible about money and he doesn't really you know he wasn't raised mm -hmm. to think that way it's like you just fight over stuff and and that's why a lot of marriages end early on because they're just not really prepared to deal with the differences Mm -hmm. And uh, it's tough being an artist. Uh, I mean, half the time, like when I have to, when I'm trying to focus on th something and I have to share the space 
with my girlfriend who I live with, uh, I'm like, wow, it would have been easier if I lived alone. But the yeah. other half the time, I'm like, oh, it's very nice to have someone, especially when you're stuck for months yeah, on end, right? right? <laughs> yes, can you imagine doing that alone? <laughs> right? The yeah, food would I, not be good. In, no. over here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. They'll yeah. be like, uh, he died from eating too much carry-out fried chicken. <laughs> Yeah, we were we were cooking a lot early on, <laughs> then we started doing the carry out a little bit more because I was we just I couldn't honestly I've been um, dealing with a I've had a, a knee issue mm -hmm. so I was on a walker for a month because of a knee wow. problem, and so of course we were stuck at home anyway, but it, it did hamper my ability to cook and things like that. So mm -hmm. no, my girlfriend Amanda, uh, she loves to cook. She went yeah. to school for it for a little bit. Oh, cool. So that's yeah. like her, one of her creative outlets. I'm like, that's awesome. I'll buy I'd, the supplies. Yeah, go, right. go at it. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> make it. I, I'm like, no, you can't make great food. Looks like we froze oh, again. Sorry. Okay, good. We're back. Yeah, we're good now. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. Back to, um, back to yeah, fun. I thought over the I was just going to say, I've thought over the past few years as a creative outlet, same thing about cooking. I really enjoy it. Um, I'm not. I've actually thought about going back to school to learn more about cooking because I awesome. enjoy it so much. But, but uh, I love watching. But still, shows. I love watching yeah, cooking me too. shows. Amanda's like, uh, why are you watching cooking shows? Just I can show you what I'm to in the do. Kitchen. I'm like, I'm like, no thanks. <laughs> I'm like, no, no. It's a There's show. More drama here. It's, yeah, it's a different experience. You kind of get to. It's like someone's making art, basically. Yeah. In the cooking oh, yeah. shows, absolutely. So uh, talk about. The movie got done, uh, the stories about our marriage, seven stories about our marriage. Then you got into CineQuest, and that was a big deal, right? Yeah. Um, I, I feel like that's a really big deal for us um, to get into mm -hmm. a, a festival like that. And I'm uh, very excited to have the world premiere at CineQuest. And, um, yeah, they had told us we were on you – know, they, they emailed to ask some questions. Would it be a world premiere? Would it, you know, this and that? And uh, so we knew we were being considered. Awesome. Uh, that was a long, long wait while we waited for them to decide, knowing you're on the bubble or not, not on the bubble, but knowing you're, you might get in. And, uh, right. you know, we got the email from them on a Sunday, I think, and so thrilled. And um, so we're supposed to have three screenings at CineQuest over the two week festival. We were going to be there for two of them, the world premiere. And then um, they have two venues um, or not two venues, but two cities, actually. They're mm -hmm. in there. Um, this is amazing. But then they're in San Jose, but then they're in another um, part of the same area that's like 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes away, basically mm -hmm. more urban area. And um, I can't remember the name of the other city right now. It's, I'm blanking. But um, but uh, so we we had our first screening at that other location and then we were supposed to have our main, you know, main location screening a few days later. And, and this, was, this was in early March, right? Yeah, it was March seventh, uh, I think, was the was the first screening, right. and that was the end of the first week of the festival. And uh, right after that, the next day, they announced they were not going to have the second week of the festival because of the coronavirus. Yeah, it was Red. coming down. South by Southwest closed, I think, right around that time. Right after that, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was uh, yeah, it was a bummer. Uh, I mean, I'm, I was. A, I was really glad we got to have our opening um, uh, screening. Yeah, because I saw some photos. To have that, but we were we were really looking forward to that next one, kind of at the main venue. But whatever, you know. So we we lost out on those other two screenings. But are they going to bring it back next year? They said that what they want to do. Okay, what they said early, when this happened was we're going to have um, a late summer. We're going to resume the festival in late summer and have the second week, and we're going to invite everybody back, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, of course, that was when early March seemed like, well, by June or July, this is going to be over. And now, back to normal, I, don't, yeah. I don't know what people think now. I don't know what any of us think. So, so I don't know what their plans are at the, this point. But mm -hmm. they've always talked that they're going to have uh, resume. And basically have the second week at some point. So, mm -hmm. um, but that's when the dominoes really fell. I mean, like you said, right after that was when South by canceled with very short notice. And mm -hmm. after South by canceled, then all bets were off because if South by could could cancel, then anybody could. So yeah. New York went into lockdown two weeks after. 
Right, right. We're so in lockdown months yeah. later. Yeah, it's crazy. So, um, so yeah, all of our and and let me preface this by saying, you know, not being able to screen at film festivals is nothing compared to the important Dying. issues behind this. Yeah, 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 totally. People who are suffering by losing their jobs or losing their lives or becoming really ill. Right. We have a friend who I have a, a colleague and friend who had been in New York with a group of uh, Baylor people over spring break mm-hmm. uh, before it was clear that this was as bad as it was. And he came back with it and he was in ICU for a while. And wow. you know, he just, it was, it was bad. Um, then what, you know, I knew somebody else who got it as a result of that trip and he barely had any symptoms. So yeah, it's, it's some so mysterious weird. illness. Yeah. So weird. So, yeah, I mean, all, you know, so kind of all perspective, it, it really did help keep it in perspective. I'll put it right. that way. That you right. know, like we, you know, we were disappointed to to lose out on some of these festivals, and then, um, you know, we were going to be the opening night film at the Dallas Video Fest, which we've screened at on, on, with other films. And yeah, um, I saw a good interview uh, with the uh, with the fest programmer. With yeah. So uh, yeah. the director uh, Bart Weiss. Uh, yeah, that's I know the one. Very well, yeah, I know him very well now from screening there, and uh, he's a film professor. Uh, up in Dallas mm-hmm. and so we've uh, we've gotten to know each other very well and uh, you know he said look let's you know uh, one of the things about Bart and and what he does is you know he's an innovator he's like well you know we're we, let's go online you know he pivoted like on the you know snap of a finger and said let's put mm-hmm. the whole thing online if, if, for whoever's willing to do it and I have I've hired a you know a PR person for this uh, project I had never really done that before mm-hmm. so um, I asked John, you know, he was very hesitant for us to do any online screenings until he talked to Bart and then Bart assured him and all the other filmmakers, look, we'll, we can limit what we asked for was limited number of, um, you know, seats sold, right. uh, but the tickets were free, but we didn't want, you know, 2000 people. And then we blow an, our whole future audience. Mm-hmm. So we limited it to two, <clears throat> 200, um, you know, registrations and, uh, and we wanted it limited to Texas state of Texas. Right. People outside of Texas couldn't watch it because really, you know, we felt like that was going to protect us with other festivals. <clears throat> so they, they, you know, we were happy to comply or oblige and, um, great screening, you know, that they had the 200, it was sold out in the sense oh, that nice. there were 200 nice. u- unique registrations for it, which meant, 200 households so probably more like you know 300 or more people watched it That's and amazing. Uh, yeah and he had a great so um he worked with the guy who's the head of the thin line documentary film festival um mm-hmm. and uh because that guy developed a technology to do online festivals and q and a's awesome. so we, yeah so he actually had a q and a set up through so they did the the screening on uh whatever the tech I don't remember what the name of the site was, but then they basically said behind the scenes, it's like a switcher. We were on zoom. <clears throat> and so people from the screening could log into the zoom chat and then Bart and I talking and, um, and then the questions were popping up on the, you know, the chat feature in zoom. So it was a Amazing. great way to have a Q and a. Yeah. So, so yeah, great experience. Um, you know, I, I, people have asked me and I've said the, I think the thing that you lack is, the face-to-face conversations with people who saw the film. Um, you know, you have a lot of conversations after people who didn't ask questions in the, in, in the Q and a, because they didn't want to, but then they want to come up and talk to you and, yeah. and meeting the other filmmakers and stuff like that. So it, it's, you know, online screenings are never going to replace that experience, but, but in lieu of not doing it at all, it's something. So. Yeah. It's a, it's a great thing uh, to keep the project moving forward. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that was made clear when Hollywood shut down, when the theater shut down, what the, what us indie filmmakers were doing, which was <clears throat> we would get some fest play, some theatrical, but really our movies uh, got to people through VOD, Vimeo, yep. through Amazon. Now everyone's doing the same thing. Now the whole right. industry, all the, you know, at yeah. various levels, you know, underground to art. To Hollywood, mm-hmm. they're doing the same thing. I think uh, this is going to be the future, even when we when movie theaters open back up. I think uh, everyone was in love with the theatrical thing, which was really a thing that's over now because 
so many millions more watch it online. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious to see. I, I, I'm not a prognosticator. I hate making predictions because I'm not that great at that. Mm-hmm. Um, I I know that people are nervous about going back to, you know, yes. movie Spike, theaters. Spike Lee said he's not going back until there's a vaccine. Right, yeah. right. But there will be a vaccine one day. Um, right. And I'll so go when, when we there's have, a vaccine. Right, and I think a lot of people will. I think mm-hmm. that people are itching to get back into the theater uh, and so when when I don't so my point is this has maybe this has changed people's perce- perspective or perception on video on demand and yes. the, especially on the film side the filmmaker side like the yeah, or the, the studio vi- side also yeah right yeah. right the viability studios take it more seriously now it's the only game mm-hmm. available when the theater shut down but when theaters open back up the theatrical thing is still going to be for studios and for filmmakers yes. the most important thing. Right. But I, I, I do think it's probably looks like we froze, froze again. Oh, we're back. Okay, back. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm just, I was just saying that I think that if the timeline for when video on demand would be kind of the standard thing that everybody would be doing was way out here. Mm-hmm. Now I think it shifted it back quite a bit. Like we're, right. we're, you know, that's so that's what I would say would be the big change. We're still going to be going to theaters when when there's a vaccine. And frankly, in some states, when the theaters are allowed to open, people are going to go whether sure. there's a vaccine or not. Mm-hmm. I think they're crazy, but that's just me. <laughs> so. Yeah, but I think uh, I like how uh, it made everyone, audience, studios and filmmakers realize, yeah, we really are in the <clears throat> web video age now. Right. Yeah, this is we can do this. Yeah. Yeah, and also uh, that this downtime is what gave me the motivation to check out YouTube further and see what's going on. In the yeah. 15 years since they've been up and running, now they're paying $7.5 billion every year to the content makers. Yeah. And that's getting up there with Hollywood. I mean, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. it's smaller amounts to a large number of people, but really right. that's that's... The, that's like half the economy, uh, yearly GDP of some countries. It's, right, it's and, amazing. And those content creators on YouTube don't want to make movies. You know, well, uh, some some are. I well, mean, some yeah, are yeah, heading I'm that way. Some about, are heading that way. Yeah, absolutely. I don't mean that nobody does. I mean, right. I, I just mean there's a lot of people making content on YouTube that it's a completely different style of content, and right, they're right. It's not. A, it's not a 90 minute fiction thing. No, no. Um, so it, it, it gives an outlet for a completely different thing that studios can't, they don't have a, a box for it. They're not set up. They're not set up to compete in that space. Yeah. No, not at all. Yeah. Amazon is set up to compete in that space. They're not really competing in the short film, you know, right. or, 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 but they have that capability. They can do whatever they want, really, with their platform. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I think Amazon. YouTube, which is Google, they'll end up owning theaters, and they'll. they'll I think Amazon was looking at AMC, so <laughs> they'll have the web uh, web stuff, and then they'll have theater stuff for people who want to go see theaters, see yeah. movies in theaters. I think it's going to be amazing. Um, hopefully, yeah. hopefully theaters can survive and film festivals can survive. Definitely the best ways to watch movies. Agreed. Didn't when Netflix it can be done safely. Netflix bought like a. Fame, like a pretty famous theater, yeah, right. So that they could, yeah, in, the, in New York, in New York, they bought one. Okay, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, IFC the, Center has the IFC Center. Yeah, yeah. So it gives them the ability to open those films, you know, in New York and Los Angeles for a week yeah. without having to worry about um, theaters not wanting to take it because it's a Netflix film. Now they can right, just right. do. It. There's all kinds of antitrust issues with that, but whatever. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, uh, Hollywood stopped making kind of the movies we liked in the 90s and 2000s anyway they're yeah. making like marvel movies which are great but you know not the kind of things that a lot of people are into as serious cinema yeah i love the marvel movies yeah mm-hmm. I, i'm a huge fan but it's it's yeah it's not it's a different a, thing it's a different thing yeah. yeah yeah it makes a lot of money it's fun yeah mm-hmm. it is like a theme park ride and and that's not taking anything away from theme park rides it's great who doesn't no, like theme know, park rides that whole argument, like, so Martin Scorsese is one of my, 
just filmmaking idols. So it was really interesting to read that because I'm a huge fan of Marvel, partially because I grew up on Marvel comics and those characters mm -hmm. were really important to me as a kid and, and seeing them realized so effectively on really screen. Really well done. That's amazing. Is, it was fun. And, uh, and I do feel like those stories have emotional resonance. Um, not all of them, of course, but, but, you know, the overarching kind of arc of the whole, uh, first, part of marvel here that we've completed recently i thought was really effective um, but i can also understand that that's a that's a type of filmmaking that's very different than what martin scorsese does or federico bellini did or you know mm -hmm. um that's those are just different things and i like <laughs> i'm comfortable holding both of them in my mind as types of things right. that i like you know right. Right. So. well i think scorsese especially he was at the top of the food chain at one yeah. point so yeah. now the top is marvel movies right so well you know he was never in the top people... in the, he, he yeah. was never in the top at the top of that chain in the way marvel is like right. financially you know his right. movies have never been huge but he's but he's been at the top of the greatest american filmmaker food chain for quite a while mm -hmm. and so but he says people listen to you know but i also right. feel like got cranky over that because they have it's weird. Like I, I like I, I love the Marvel movies. And I understand why I like them, but I also think they're very well made. You know, type of, of that type of movie. It's amazing what they've done. Technically, is amazing. Yeah, but I don't think of it as the same as say Goodfellas. Since we're talking about no. Scorsese, is right. Goodfellas? It's a completely different animal, and so I can like both of those things on different levels and for different reasons. You yeah, know? they don't have to compete with each other necessarily, but they do in Scorsese's head. Well, yeah, I understand why he's saying what he's saying. I understand that he, when he's saying it's not cinema, he, yeah. he has a definition of cinema that is this. And I, yeah. that's, you know, that's fine. I mean, I, I for one, I'm not going to argue with one of the greatest American filmmakers of all time. So. There we go. Also, I think uh, him and Coppola, they're having a hard time getting their projects financed through the traditional Hollywood avenues. Right. So they're turning to uh, Coppola self-financing with his wine, wine business. And uh, yeah. <laughs> That's that's a great way, which is what a lot of indie filmmakers do. Other alternative financing schemes, and yeah. uh, Scorsese, Netflix, and Apple. Apple is paying two hundred million for his new thing. I heard. I heard that too. Was it uh, Paramount was supposed to do it, and they got nervous about the costs? I think I heard. Uh, maybe and it was Paramount, but yeah, it's a lot of money. I mean, and he so. made he he made uh, the last one with Netflix for the same reason because yeah, yeah. it was going to cost too much money because of the technology and the scope of the story and Netflix wants Netflix does. I mean, their business model, I can't understand, but they <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> How do they have they, an unlimited amount of money? It seems like it, <laughs> right. but they certainly want to be in business with certain kinds of filmmakers. Right. And that is really, I mean, that's smart because now if you know the next Martin Scorsese film, is going to be on Netflix. Well, like, I would sign up for Netflix for that. Yeah, you know, that's what I do. I, I, I have an option of being on like 50 platforms. I oh, shut gosh. down most of them unless, until yeah. something good good comes along. I signed up Smart. for uh, I signed up for Netflix again this month because oh the Patton Oswalt special came out. It was good. I was like oh I want to see that. So <laughs> yeah, it was I'm like, very oh, let's good. let's pay seven dollars or eight dollars to Netflix this year. So yeah. let's let's talk about one of the new things that you did. In the new movie, you had someone who identifies as black, someone who identifies as white, so it became yeah. like an interracial marriage story. So right. that's a new thing to your filmmaking. Uh, what were the positives and negatives of that type of storytelling? Um, I don't think there was anything negative, really. I mean, for, you know, the, I think the and the reasoning behind it for me was realizing kind of as my own kind of understanding of racial issues in America has... Um, changed in the past um you grew up in brooklyn right no, you were born no in brooklyn. i was born in staten island got it um so really not you know racially mm -hmm. diverse right. <laughs> in staten island but then we moved to georgia like the outside atlanta when i was right. pretty young so also not terribly racially yeah, diverse. Yeah. so you know it wasn't like um i i i thought of myself um uh, you know, we're going to get into racism and anti-racism sure, and those sure. kinds of things. So, so race, like race theory, colonialism, yeah, right. slavery, sure. So, Every, like, everything's open. I have never thought of myself as racist um, because I was raised to believe all people are equal and all those right. things. But 
in recent years have really kind of started to understand systemic racism much better and to understand how we all fit into that, um, whether we mean to or not. Right. I, uh, read the book White Fragility recently, mm-hmm. which was fantastic. And it you know, talks about the difference between acts of prejudice versus racism, which is systemic. Um, so understanding the difference between that was really powerful for me. Of course, that's a recent thing I just read. But uh, honestly, part of the decision was just looking at the films I'd made and seeing a lot of white faces mm-hmm. and not seeing faces of other colors and realizing that I just that doesn't reflect the world. And mm-hmm. I didn't want to be a part of, of that. I didn't want to yeah, yeah. make, you know, I wanted to change that in my own work. Yeah, that's something so, I complained about when... Uh... Joe Swanberg and Mumblecore started becoming uh, popular. But, sure, uh, sure. Yeah, I didn't complain about that in your movies because you live in Texas and you, li- you yeah. know, I didn't know how, di- <laughs> yeah. how diverse it is. And you make your, you're limited by your resources from the college. So I don't know how we diverse are, the talent pool is. Well, we are limited, um, but Dallas is two hours away and Austin is an hour and a half away. And there sure. are actors of color in both places and great mm-hmm. actors at, as Oh, frozen yeah. again. Let's hope we're coming back. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, All good. Right. So, so you I, have access to minority talent if you try hard. Yeah. If you try, yeah, if you look yeah. for it. And I, yeah. we use, um, uh, what's the web casting? Backstage? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, Backstage. For, I use yeah, it. Yeah, that. And so we really, we did see talent from Dallas and Austin, but we, we also saw talent from, you know, all over the country because we were casting. LA, New that. York. Nationally, yeah, in yeah. LA, New York, and um, actually, the guy who we cast in the lead came through. As things happen like this a lot, but um, another filmmaker friend of mine from North Carolina mm-hmm. um, had worked with him. He, he had, the actor had had a small role in his last film, mm-hmm. and you know, he said, "Look, you should check him out." And so I did a, you know, he, he sent me an audition tape. And then I had a, we moved from the audition tape to a Skype three-way call with the lead actress who had already been cast mm-hmm. and did, a, we did a, a, you know, live read of a couple of scenes uh, and, you know, he was great. Um, so, yeah, I, but, but just in terms of the, the race issue, it was really like partially, partially when I was writing the script and because I was drawing on my own experience, I wanted to distance that a little bit and not yeah. make it like where people would say, oh, this is about you. Uh, not too autobiographical. Yeah, yeah. And so there were there were some other dramatic changes, and but that was one of them. And then once I made that decision, then it was like, well, how am I going to write this? Because I don't know this guy's experience. Um, mm-hmm. So I, you know, had to write some things that felt real to me and then draw on, you know, friends to read it and, you know, give me their feedback and, you know, make sure I was kind of hitting these notes. Right. And also, and also, you probably opened it up to the actor to say oh. this makes no sense. Yeah, in fact, I, I, that was one of the things I asked him about. You know, because uh, the character is writing a, trying to write a film about Langston Hughes, and you know, I talked to him about some of that stuff, and, <clears throat> and I said, you know, does this ring true to you? And I, he said, you know, yeah. Um, he said initially his reaction to reading that stuff was um, feeling like, is this character going to be written as like everything about him is because he's black Mm -hmm. and he said but it wasn't and he liked that because he said you know and this is his words so that being black is a part of who he is but it's not the only thing that he is and he liked the fact that there were things that had to do with race in the story but there were other issues that were unrelated to that and so that really related for me that you know we were kind of hitting those issues in the right place yeah, that's that. I I figured that out a long time ago. That if you're writing for someone whose experience you don't have access to, you know, you know, women in my case, you know, people from different ethnic backgrounds. I write uh, what I think would work. Then when I work with the actor, I'm like, okay, all of this is open to, you know, if yeah. you, if this is ridiculous, if a woman in this situation would never say that. You're right. all, you know, completely open to revising it. But luckily, if the writer does a good job, no problem. If the writer does a good job, uh, you know, authentic human mm-hmm. reactions uh, in most cases, we can kind of predict. 
Yeah, I, I feel you're, uh, that's exactly right. In my experience, I, I feel like if you're a good observer of human nature, you can, mm-hmm. you can write characters. Um, but I've also had, you know, there's a scene in this movie where um, the characters have had a fight and after being apart for a little bit, I'll, I'll let you watch it and I won't spoil anything. But um, when they come back together in the script, like they were fine, everything was fine. And you awesome. know, the actress, the actress said, I wouldn't be that okay that quick <laughs> right, you know right, she said right. i'm like like it's fine the, the the big argument is over but i'm still not okay and mm-hmm. i'm like i trusted her instinct and we played the scene that way and it really worked and it's so and it worked in part because it's more melancholy anyway it's like you know it, it gives more tension to the scene but also that's just a real kind of human note that she was giving which is if i had a big argument like that with my husband you know, and I went off and blew, we both blew off some steam. When we came back, we wouldn't be like, everything's fine. You know, yeah, it would take some time, depending right. on the personality. Yeah, t- exactly. It, it really does depend on the personality. But she was helping to build that character at that point, And so her input really mattered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, one, I mean, uh, rel- in related to where the world is heading, one advantage I had was growing up in a, multi-ethnic country with a culture that was not American, then coming here at a young age, growing up in Washington, D.C. area, which was very multi-ethnic and middle class and kind of, I mean, suburban Maryland, right? You've been there. It's very well-developed, probably like suburban Texas. So I realized from an early on, most, you know, human, ethnic, racial, national identities are you know, they're cobbled together. They're kind of like performances. You write a script, you give it to the actor, and the actor brings it to life. Whereas people who don't uh, look deeply into it and they're born into a certain place, they're, and they don't, you know, they're they're not, they're not forced to scan their thoughts. They think, oh, this is natural that, you know, I feel I'm Canadian. Obviously, I'm Canadian. It's like a biological fact, but not a subtle performance that happens over time. So, uh, so the film world can definitely help people figure out, navigate the current racial and ethnic issues, I think. I think so, too. Yeah, absolutely. I, if, if not, then we're in the wrong business because I mean, yeah, stories, is... the, stories are the most uh, powerful <clears throat> tool for changing culture, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and movies are, you know, among the most dominant forms of storytelling right now. Um, right. You know, whether or not the, the movies, the, the way we make movies remains that is, you know, remains to be seen. But, but for now, they still are incredibly influential. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's all, even YouTube is just filmed content. They're yeah. using video yeah. and they're using fiction and, uh, and nonfiction, but still very related, heavily influenced by cinema. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. When we look at something, you know, we have an idea of what movies are. So everyone does. So. Uh, mm-hmm. Movies are still super influential. Uh, yeah, I think when I kind of saw the uh, filmmaking world change after uh, Spike Lee came on the scene, yeah, and yeah. Pr- versus prior to Spike Lee. Now mm-hmm. you know, thirty years later, we have a much more uh, multi-ethnic uh, filmmaking culture, thanks to digital video. Anyone can make movies now, yeah. so yeah. Uh, things are going forward in a good way. It's amazing the changes America has gone through in a hundred years. It is amazing the things we still need to change too. <laughs> True. We have a, well, I mean, worldwide, it's a long way to go. The, the, yeah. develop, the developed countries are less than 20% of the global population. So we're mm-hmm. living in like a sci-fi land compared to much yeah. of humanity. Oh, yeah. Like 80% of humanity is in under develop, in, a, in a developing countries or underdeveloped yeah. countries. So like yeah. they look at us and go, wow, what kind of insanity is that? <laughs> yeah, just especially, I mean, I don't know when people will watch this exactly, but because we're having this during, you know, riots in the streets in right. many cities because right. of uh, George Floyd's death. And, yeah, um, sad situation. It's a horrible situation, but it just does remind us how, um, you know, we we kind of always think things have changed and then yeah. then we're not sure. And then we look and say, well, have they really changed? You know, there's a lot that hasn't. So. There's, there's a lot of areas that need work. People are yeah. marching in the 60s against police br- police brutality. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah. hopefully we will figure it out. 
what uh, do you want to do after this? I mean, once the world gets back to where <laughs> right. we can shoot a movie. Well, I get, yeah, I want to. I do want to get to make another film after this, and I have not figured out what that would be. But in the meantime, I'm working on a. Um, <clears throat> So my colleagues in the theater program here at Baylor, um, of course, their season got blown up by by this um, right. COVID nineteen thing as well because they can't have a traditional yeah, can't come together. season of theater. Yeah, right. and they don't know when they can, so they can't start rehearsing for shows that they don't know if they can have. And but they because they're a theater performance, they have a theater performance program. They have to do something. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm talking with uh, their chair about collaborating with them to do a piece that would be kind of what I was talking about relationships oh, and nice. uh, how we develop those relationships in Zoom and Skype and Microsoft Teams and all these things. Um, but instead of being a film thing like pieced together in post production, it would be performed live on oh, those great. platforms. So, great. Um, and then so it's kind of a combination of theater, yeah, and recorded. Yeah, yeah. Um, and with the idea that you could take this then live performance, record it and submit it for festivals and, you know, oh, that kind great. of thing. So, yeah, yeah so I'm excited about it because it, it presents a lot of challenges for the writing because you have to write it as though it's a live thing being performed. But also, you know. We're frozen for a minute. Let's see if you're back on. Yeah, there we go. Back on. Good. OK. Yeah. Uh, so it, it has to be written so that it can be performed live, but also has to be done through these platforms with all the costume changes and things that you would do in theater. So right. it's, it's going to be a balancing act. It's like a play. Act. It's that, like a film yeah, play. Exactly. And it's, it really excites me to, to be able to... It's a new challenge that, honestly, once this virus hit, I kind of went into a uh, creative rut. I just mm -hmm. I think the anxiety of everything happening. I think every, everyone's like that. For like a month, we well, didn't do anything. Yeah, except creative. for Steven Soderbergh, who's written like two movies while he's been. Yeah, yeah well, he, <laughs> he, he went through this by making Contagion like two, uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> right. He right. went through so all he, the fear. He knew. He he's like, oh. that demon. Yeah. yeah, he's like, I know what's going to happen. It's the bat. I know. <laughs> so when they, when the, they came to me with this notion, this idea, uh, all of a sudden it's, it was like, oh, this is interesting. And so it kind of just gave me a new creative energy to, uh, to do. So that's probably, you know, if that all comes together, which hopefully it will, um, that'll be my next thing that I'll spend significant kind of creative time working on. Um, and then, yeah, you know, I've had like probably five different screenplay ideas. I'm not quite as prolific as you. Uh, but I come up with ideas and then I just, I kind of go down the road with it a little bit and it just doesn't, I can't kind of figure out where to take it. And so I don't take it any further. So I've had a few of those that I just haven't taken down the road all the way. Mm -hmm. Nothing that like when, when seven short films about our marriage came in my head, it was, again, it was that, Oh, I got to yeah. write this. You yeah, know? That's a, so, that sounds like a great idea. Let's go. Yeah. So right. when that happens, I know I'm, I'm going to do it. And it just hasn't happened with um, with any other screenplay ideas. But this this play, uh, I think it happened with that. So so that's the route I'm going to go. You know, for a while mm -hmm. I'll do that and see if it yields anything interesting, and um, and then we'll see from there. Good. The using inspiration from live theater, I do that. Like I try to get my actors ready as if it's a play. Like if yeah. they have to perform the entire yeah. script in an hour and a half. And I have to shoot it in an hour and a half. We could do it. I mean, we, yeah. we never, we never have to, but it makes it possible to shoot a movie in a couple of weeks as opposed yeah. to a couple of months. Yeah, and you know, you've seen my other movies, and this one right. you'll see too. There are lots of all long of them. Takes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's lots of long takes, and so I really think of the movies as um, they're very influenced by by playwriting mm -hmm. um, because the uh, long scenes, long takes. Not, not a ton of locations, and that's a necessity of low-budget filmmaking. But, right. you know, where we started um, could have been done as a play, you know, yeah. uh, if I would changed a few things around, because it was really, in some place, in some cases, just long dialogue scenes yeah. um, that we added walking and talking outside to to kind of liven them up for, for film, but you could do those in a different way on the stage. And so... Um, I don't, you know, when you watch this one, I don't think that's quite as true of this one, but I, you know, I do think, um, I learned a lot of stuff uh, about m telling stories from theater. So good. Have you seen, uh, uh, Amir Madla's movie, man? 
No, I have not. I'll, I'll send you the link. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, I, mean, I mean, there's two people having uh, stuff happening between two people in a house. But he, for the first half, he did, he showed a lot of just things in the house, the guy waking up, getting ready outside. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like slow cinema in the, in yeah. the sense that slow, slow cinema is evolving. Some, some of your stuff is like that, if, except slow cinema filmmakers work in lots of shots of, the na of nature, like yeah. Love Diaz. He makes eight-hour movies of people walking through. So, yeah, uh, yeah all these things are merging together. Uh, live theater, slow cinema, traditional filmmaking, YouTube. Yeah, yeah they're, they're all coming together into one point. So one other area, how do you feel about indie film distribution and marketing and monetizing at this point? You know, it's... So all my films have been... More, most filmmakers will be like, it sucks. All, all three yeah, sucks. yeah. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that uh, because I feel that there are more opportunities for independent film to be distributed now than there ever were, you know, when we were coming up. Definitely. Um, so, like, have I've had the ability through my distributor on the previous five films to have those films on Amazon Prime and on iTunes and Google Play and other services, um, Roku TV and, you know, mm -hmm. various things. A couple of cable platforms. One, My last film got sold to uh, a, a company in China. Awesome. <clears throat> so for distribution there. Yeah. So I don't know what the Chinese uh, are thinking of blur circle, but it's there. So. They're checking it out. Some are checking it out. So, um, you know, like that wouldn't have happened for a filmmaker of my level, I'll say, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, but it's yeah. happening now. So I think that's a good thing. I think the, 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 the difficult side of it is that there's, um, I always use the phrase noise in the system. There's a lot of noise in the system. Um, you know, there's, if, because if we can do it, so can thousands of other people. <laughs> and right. so, um, you know, when I meet with, like I'm talking to distributors for my <clears throat> new film and, um, you know, I'm looking at the catalog from this distributor who's interested in the film. And it's just like, you know, page after page after page after page of films that no one's ever heard of, including They're not me. marketing it. They're not marketing it, yeah. Well, and in some cases they are. I mean, this is the the thing you look for. With it. that's what I was going to get to is finding a distributor who's willing to kind of market your film to a certain audience. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, it's a it's a numbers game for most of them. They have to sign up enough films that they can um, aggregate the numbers and and make money. And right. I, I respect that. They're in the they're in it for business. You know, they're they're, and they're so, in selling by the volume. Right. And so if you sign up that many films, um, you can't give them all individualized attention. But um, but yeah, I mean, I, so that's the, the downside part is kind of figuring out where does a filmmaker like myself um, land? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not, um, you know, if I made these projects that I'm making with um, known talent, uh, that'd be a different story. You know, right. um, I think they're because I feel very confident in the filmmaking, um, the acting as well I, I not that so let me preface it by saying i don't want to replace the mm -hmm. people i've worked with but if i had for example used known talent in this latest film <clears throat> it's an easier sell because you have right. pictures on the poster of people that you've heard of and for someone like on, netflix for maybe i right. like netflix yeah right when it's on netflix and people look at that little poster image and they recognize the actors i mean i do the same thing i'm not mm -hmm. i'm not insulting people because of that you're like oh well Alec Baldwin's in this. What what is this? I don't know this movie. At least worth just, taking a look if you like the actor. right. Just to pick a name out of the hat, you know. Right. So everybody's got those actors that they're interested in, and so if they see they're in something, they'll check it out. So, and I think just having an actor with a name or a face in your film is like an instant. Um, <clears throat> uh, it 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 bestows credibility to the level film. Uh, and a level of comfort. Right, whether deserved or not. It, it, right gives that credibility so <clears throat> that's what so without you pay the that, that's what you pay the known actors for exactly and right. you're paying them in part for that credibility not just the right. talent right. <laughs> so so the downside is yeah we can continue to make movies and I, i've said this i've had this conversation with friends <clears throat> you know i'm going to continue to make movies and um make them with the people that i make them with and do we at some point 
move beyond where we are, you know, mm -hmm. and how do you do that? Well, and, in, in, in New York, uh, where I live, that question comes up pretty fast because the distance between my friends who are in SAG now and famous actors in SAG that they're friends mm -hmm. with is not very, not very, not very uh, far. Right. Like, if, no, you can so, get... if certain things were arranged properly, I yeah. could definitely have stars in the movies, but then it becomes a, uh, you have to follow certain SAG rules. Yes. It becomes an entirely different, hundred times more expensive thing. Like more expensive and very complicated. Very um, complicated. You know, we worked with a SAG actor, one SAG actor, Mm -hmm. on this last film and uh just the paperwork and not him he was great it, it wasn't about he wasn't he didn't make life difficult or anything like that but just the paperwork to deal with sag for one actor was mm -hmm. so so much of a headache that i wouldn't probably do it again unless it was somebody whose like name was mm -hmm. obviously going to add something to the project right. or I would let somebody, I, you know, and here's what I'd really like to move to the point where I'm writing and directing, but some other entity <laughs> is producing and right. that's, takes that's, care of that. Yeah. It takes yeah. care of the, the SAG stuff. Uh, yeah. Well, I had an interesting thing happen also. Uh, one of the, one of the actors I'm going to work with in the future is Phi Core. And I'm like, uh, what is, how difficult is the paperwork is going to be? He's like, don't paperwork is almost nothing. We make an arrangement. And uh, he takes care of the SAG stuff. We have a separate agreement for the project. So that's, yeah. th that actually, I mean, I've heard from friends who became SAG actors. Some are contemplating going five core because they're missing out on a lot of high quality indie stuff that's not Hollywood, but really they would yeah. like to have on their resume. They would like to get the pay, few thousand that comes with it. You know, it's a... Uh, it's a SAG is a bizarre thing. It's from I mean it's yeah. great for dealing with Hollywood, but now we yeah. have YouTube filmmakers, indie filmmakers, so many people ma making content. Some I feel like some easier like an Uber type you know app hey. is needed. You know. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Well, actors want to act, and uh, right. and filmmakers want to make movies, no matter right. what. Right. They're just I was going to say they're just like us. They want to make interesting things, and right. um, and and they're at the, the mercy of somebody bringing an interesting project to them um right. you know and i'm not talking about brad pitt i'm talking right. about your average workaday actor who mm -hmm. maybe is somebody you've seen in something but maybe not and they just would love to work on something interesting so many talented um, actors out there yeah tons so they want to do it um but if they're in sag there are those limitations and they can be mm -hmm. really you know that, that's a pain um it, it was a you know, and, and I keep saying it's a pain. Like I didn't have to do most of the right. stuff because I you had to produce two other it. people, two other people producing with me. <clears throat> so I, I had to deal with some of it, but most of it they dealt with. But it's it's a huge hassle for everybody. So you know, yeah, it's not, it just, SAG is not set up to deal with ultra low budget, no budget no, filmmakers. No, no, because every there's not time much I, in it for them. Yeah, every time I make a movie, I take a look. I'm like, what? Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> it's like Same a, thing. It's like a booklet, thousand page booklet. <laughs> or, yeah. you know, they're like, you Basically, signed this five page document, but you're signing up to this thousand page yeah. thing. I'm like, right. what? <laughs> we basically didn't want to leave uh, like any stone unturned in the casting. Right. So we, when we put it on backstage, we, we said union or non union, you know, we were right. willing to work with. And, um, and, you know, the best actor for the, uh, the role of um, plays the, the lead actress's father in the mm -hmm. story. So <clears throat> the father of the groom, so to speak, that's the scene he's in. And he was the best actor for it, ultimately. And he's a, you know, an actor who he's a SAG actor. He's been on, you know, Gotham and other awesome. television shows and, you know, not a name that you would know necessarily, but a really good actor, really good character actor and um, mm -hmm. great face for the role, you know. <clears throat> so we wanted to work with him. It was it was worthwhile. But um you know, but I, so I will say it was worthwhile to work with a good actor mm -hmm. and he was great. I just, mm -hmm. it's the paperwork is a, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a different <laughs> it's a project. Right? Yes. One thing I wanted to say, another professor, film professor, filmmaker, who's very uh, productive and is well regarded in the, in the film festival world is Kevin, Kevin Jerome Everson. He makes, okay. uh, he teaches film at university of Virginia, I think. And he okay. makes a lot of experimental things, some features, Mm -hmm. And check out some of his stuff. 
if you okay. get tired of if you get tired of making uh, fiction features, you'd be like, forget it. I'm just gonna shoot. <laughs> Go experimental. <laughs> experimental. I'm gonna make fifty. Uh, he's made like a hundred to two hundred experimental movies because they're yeah. faster to make. Oh yeah. Crew of one usually. Sometimes they're more elaborate. So and uh, you could be like, yeah, next few years. You know, it's gonna be maybe that's what all, we're all going to be doing while we're waiting for a vaccine. It, it might be taking found footage, you know, recording a narration yeah. uh, about getting, you know, having a more effect in the marketplace with our indie movies. What I'm going to try with Slow Romance is to try to advertise to a million people who might be interested and get, work up to between a million and a 10 million. What I find out is that Facebook ads uh twitter ads google ads you can reach about a thousand people targeted by interest for yeah. about seven thousand eight thousand dollars no not a thousand people a million people okay. for around uh so it's like uh it's like something like a thousand people for seven dollars thousand impressions obviously okay. you know it goes up by the time you get to a million it yeah, adds yeah. up to real money so that's another way around besides using known actors because documentaries uh, break out to people without known actors by just targeting uh, the potential customers in large numbers. Yes. And I, I've heard this from a number of people, including the distributor we've been with that Facebook, some targeted Facebook advertising is, is a strong way to go. <clears throat> and I'm not opposed to it. I mm -hmm. really don't understand how Facebook ads work and the impressions mm -hmm. and everything. So maybe you and I can have an offline conversation sure. yeah, where yeah. you can uh, tell me uh, some of that uh, at some point. Yeah. Also, I'm going to keep track and see if it actually yeah. works. You know, on a that's I've the real it, question. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it work on the scale of a few thousand people. When yeah. we scale up to million, you know, how effective is it? Right. Yeah, um, and I think it's really about knowing your target audience well. And mm -hmm. some of my films, I'm hard pressed to figure out. Um, like I would say with Werewolf Ninja Philosopher, you can probably identify some features of what that target mm -hmm. audience would look like. With something like Blur Circle, for example, it's a, uh, I mean, there's a, you know, mothers maybe, right. you know, or, but that's a wide category. So yeah, like, how a good do you drama. Kind of drill, yeah. yeah. How I do you think... drill down to what the, the, the uh, demographics are of your audience yeah. is what I'm yeah, trying the, to say. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is to develop yourself as an, as a filmmaker, as an artist, as Kevin Jerome Everson has done, mm -hmm. a certain number of people will see everything he makes, no right. matter how wild, experimental. Like I will, th I, uh, same with Jarmish, right? Same with Spike Lee. Yeah. You know. And I've I got think, you. You'll watch right. everything I make. <laughs> right, right, right. It's and you person. might have, you might have a hundred people like that. And, oh, maybe you know, so. Yeah. 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 And if you could get all that stuff into one website mm -hmm. and you know just build a identity. I mean, yeah. that's kind of the stuff that we're into, the, uh, our tour filmmakers, whatever yeah. that word is. Right. <laughs> filmmakers as writers, basically, from France, uh, yeah. for the French film theater. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's possible. Good time to be making content. Yes. Well, that I agree with. Yeah, completely. So, um, especially right now, content is needed. So, right. To help us survive the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So, so I'll post this up later today. And okay. tomorrow or early this week, I'm going to watch the movie and I'll do a separate round of posts about the movie. All right, great. And I'll contact yeah. you when this is up. Hope, right. hope you had a good time, Chris. I did. Thank you, CJ. You know what was the best part uh, is just uh, we haven't had this long a conversation in a long time. So I, That's true. And, uh, it was nice to talk to you again. Yeah, we, <laughs> we'll do this off, off, you know, off camera you know, on a regular basis. Yes. Every, every, <laughs> every few months might be a good idea. Okay, sounds great. Sounds good. Talk to you soon. All right, bye-bye. Okay, thank you.